Hello. Welcome to Astronomy Magazine's podcast. I'm Senior Editor Michael Bakich. In this week's show, I'm taking you on a tour of the constellation Scorpius, the Scorpion. To the Greeks, Scorpius represented the deadly beast who ambushed and slew Orion the Hunter as he walked along his favorite hunting trail. To the natives of the South Pacific, this star pattern represents the hook of the god Maui. As he cast the hook into the sea, Maui hauled in quite a catch. New Zealand. Seven constellations border Scorpius. Era, the altar. Corona Australis, the southern crown. Libra, the scales. Lupus, the wolf. Norma, the carpenter's square. Aphiuchus, the serpent bearer and Sagittarius the Archer. As for its size, Scorpius ranks as the 33rd largest of the 88 constellations that cover the sky. It envelops 497 square degrees. That's 1.2% of the sky. While Scorpius falls in the middle of the size range, it ranks as the 10th brightest constellation. It contains 13 of the 200 brightest stars including three of the top 50 most brilliant. Its brightest star is Antares, Alpha Scorpii, which shines at magnitude 1.1. In all, Scorpius contains 62 stars brighter than magnitude 5.5. In addition to Antares, many of Scorpius' stars have unusual-sounding proper names. Among them are Dushuba, Graphias, Sargas, Shaula, and here's an alternate name for Antares, Vespertilio. Antares is Scorpius' most famous star, but only partly because of its brightness. Antares is a red star, and because it lies in the band of the zodiac, the planets often appear nearby. It was because of its color, and because of the frequent proximity of Mars, whose nickname is the Red Planet, that this star received its name, Antares. Antares is a literal combination of the terms anti and Ares, the Greek equivalent of the Roman war god. So, in essence, the star became Antares, the rival of Mars, at least in color. Scorpius is a midway constellation. It's completely visible south of latitude 44 degrees north, But the only places on Earth where you'll see no part of the constellation lie north of latitude 82 degrees north. Scorpius contains just one asterism, but it includes most of the constellation's stars. It's the fish hook. The difference between an asterism and a constellation is that an asterism isn't one of the 88 official constellations. Rather, it's just a recognizable group of stars that forms some picture. Because parts of this constellation lie in or near the Milky Way, Scorpius is loaded with deep sky objects. It contains four Messier objects, M4, M6, M7, and M80. M4 and M80 are globular clusters, while M6 and M7 are open clusters. Look about one degree west of Antares for M4. This spectacular cluster shines at magnitude 5.8, and sharp-eyed observers have no trouble spotting it naked eye from a dark sight. M4 lies closer to a first magnitude star than any other Messier object, and it's the closest globular cluster to Earth. This ball of suns lies only 5,600 light-years away. Another Messier object, M80, lies about midway between Antares and Beta Scorpii. M80 appears smaller and, at magnitude 7.3, fainter than M4, and it should. M80 lies more than six times farther away than M4 and only 12,000 light years from our galaxy's center. While you'll see several hundred stars in M4 through a 12-inch scope, The same instrument pointed at M80 reveals only about 50. As you tour Scorpius, don't miss the planetary nebula NGC 6072, which lies 8 degrees west-southwest of Epsilon Scorpii. Through a 6-inch scope, 
NGC 6072 appears as a uniform disk one arc minute across. Through larger scopes equipped with nebula filters, you'll see a dark lane dividing the northern half from the southern. One of the sky's greatest open clusters lies among an immense group of hot, young stars known as the Scorpius OB1 Association. This group extends more than halfway from Zeta to Mu Scorpii. To the naked eye, this thin band of stars looks like a large, diffuse comet. The cluster I mentioned, NGC 6231, lies at the association's southern end. Astronomers have dubbed it the Northern Jewel Box, a reference to a similarly magnificent cluster called the Jewel Box, which lies in the constellation Crux, the Southern Cross. NGC 6231 contains more than 100 stars in a 12 arc minute wide circle. A nod of a half dozen bright stars stands out in the center. Many 10th and 11th magnitude stars surround this core and make the northern jewel box a stunning sight. Just north of the center of a line joining Lambda and Mu Scorpii lies one of the sky's brightest and most massive planetary nebulae. It's called the Bug Nebula, and it's also known as NGC 6302. While most planetaries are round, the Bug Nebula is four times longer than it is wide. If your sky is steady, Crank up the magnification to see some great details in this celestial showpiece. And speaking of showpieces, move two degrees northeast of the Bug Nebula to find the Cat's Paw Nebula, NGC 6334. This massive cloud of hydrogen ranks among the Milky Way's largest star-forming regions. Through an 8-inch telescope equipped with a nebula filter, you'll spot five individual nebulous patches spanning an area half a degree across. To the upper left of the two stars marking the Scorpion Stinger, you'll find the Butterfly Cluster, M6, and Ptolemy's Cluster, M7. Both of these open clusters stand out easily to the naked eye, and their magnitudes tell you why. M6 glows at magnitude 4.2, and M7 shines even brighter at magnitude 3.3. Binoculars that give magnifications of 10 and higher work great for viewing these clusters, as do wide-field telescope eyepiece combinations. At higher powers, a 6-inch scope shows 50 stars in M6 and more than double that number in M7. And with that, I'll wrap up our look at Scorpius. To see a chart of this constellation or watch a video version of this podcast, look for this episode's page at astronomy.com slash podcast. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, you can contact us at podcast at astronomy.com. <laughs>